Hello, and welcome to Credibly Challenged. My name is Matt Bizantz, and I'm a bank regulatory partner at Mayor Brown. Credibly Challenged is a podcast series on bank risk management practices, and today we are joined by someone who has a great broad view on what banks are up to. Ethan Heisler is the editor-in-chief and founder of the Bank Treasury Newsletter. He routinely engages with banks of all sizes on the core issues to their operations. Um, Today, we're going to talk a little bit about um, some things he's been seeing in the market recently. But first, I want to thank you, Ethan, for joining the program. Thanks, Matt, for having me. So one thing that we talked about in the pre-session that I think is really interesting for audiences is about the federal home loan bank system. It's this sleepy, um, poorly known uh, copy almost of the Federal Reserve System, but it is not the lender of last resort, even if it does lend to banks on fairly generous terms. Uh, What are you seeing as far as lending in um, in this market? Well, it's funny, Matt, that you say uh, it's the sleepy version of the Federal Reserve since it was started, uh, and many people don't know this, by Herbert Hoover in 1932. So in its purpose grew out of the Great Depression and the failure of many banks to help financial institutions to provide mortgages to uh, or provide the financing or the, the liquidity to banks to support the mortgage market. Um, and that has always been its core f- function all along. Um, I I have never heard the Federal Home Loan Bank until just recently being referred to as some sort of like lender of last resort in a would-be sense. I've never heard of financial institutions actually trying to approach the Federal Home Loan Banks for that purpose. Uh, generally, banks approach the Federal Home Loan Banks for uh, interim financing. So my deposits are running a little light compared to where I could borrow some money in the wholesale markets. Let me take advantage of the home loans and uh, and, and use an advance here, which will bridge until deposits grow and I have better longer term financing options. Um, it's important also to understand that the federal home loan banks are one of several tools that a bank treasurer has in, um, in, in, in financing his balance sheet or her balance sheet. Mm-hmm. Uh, in addition to this, um, banks have been using brokered CDs. Uh, mm-hmm. They have also uh, could raise deposits through targeted deposit raising in, in certain markets with certain um, – the point is, yeah. there are one of many. So mm-hmm. I think it's very important when people talk about the federal home loan bank system, they say, oh, they're these weird lenders of last resort. And where they come to this conversation mm-hmm. to understand that they're part of the operational toolkit that mm-hmm. are, is used to run a bank balance sheet, to do the asset liability. Um but they did, if I'm I'm not wrong, get a lot of coverage after the failures of the banks in 2023. Um, when oh, and and also those- back in the financial crisis, they had advances to Washington Mutual. They've had advances to IndyMac. So mm-hmm. the conversation is not a new conversation in 2023. It's it goes well back to the financial crisis, perhaps before that, but definitely in the financial crisis because they figured that way. Um, there's always been in the banking industry um, a view of the Fed's discount window as attached as having a stigma and in a industry that is so dependent on public trust even the hint of uncertainty about viability is enough to cause the very thing that you wanted to avoid so Banks have always been looking for ways to quietly f- solve a problem if it's a short-term problem. Um, and and also they have the I, benefit at the the flibs that it's it's not public in the same way now. At least after a couple of years, discount window borrowings become public. Right, that is true. But neither is borrowing from my bank if I'm a corporation today mm-hmm. uh, public. It is a bank. And importantly, the federal home loan banks are uh, joint and several. Mm 
So they mm -hmm. raise, they have a preferred ability to raise money uh, uh, as a uh, as a as a federal agency like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. And mm -hmm. so they get a preferred rate that way and can provide that to their members. Um, it is a cooperative, however, so uh, and, and therefore owned by the members of that home loan bank. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think we have time to really go through the whole structure of it, but my point was that its role as lender of last resort has never really been a topic. It's mm -hmm. being labeled that way. And I think it's important to understand two things. The federal home loan banks can provide financing to their members during business hours. The federal home loan banks are not available to provide financing to their members at midnight or on the weekends. Mm -hmm. So if we specifically refer to Silicon Valley, to Signature Bank, and the failures of those institutions around uh, basic operational governance. So have a working line with the federal home loan banks, have working lines with, or sorry, with the Federal Reserve, uh, have ability, another backup means, have a, uh, a contingent funding plan. I mean, all those mm -hmm. things that they lacked mm -hmm. would still never have saved them if they needed to come into the Federal Reserve or the federal home loan banks seriously at when they were actually failing. That that everybody has understood this. They do believe, and there is a general view, that banks simply relying on the federal home loan banks to plug big holes, that needs to be more clearly understood. Mm -hmm. We're not here, federal home loan banks, and by the way, neither is the Federal Reserve under Rule 10B uh, of the Federal Reserve Act. Uh, neither of these organizations provide liquidity financing to failing members. Mm -hmm. That's really not what they're supposed to do. The problem comes down to when is somebody looking for money and they need a, they need some help to get over, they need a, a little bit of an assistance and they'll mm -hmm. be fine. Right. And when are they literally failing and you could throw them a life preserver, but they might as well be throwing them an anchor. It's it's right. it's not going to help. Right. And the federal home loan banks, historically, before the financial crisis, actually used to have bank examiners. Mm -hmm. And they were not good at examining SNLs. Mm -hmm. That's why they got out of that business. Right. And um, I think there's an institutional reluctance on the part of the federal home loan banks to get back into the business of say, oh, I need to ass assess a member and whether that member is a viable, is is it borrowing money because it just needs money operationally mm -hmm. or is it borrowing money because it's going to fail? Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we've just, we've, you know, in this this clickbait type world that we live in, mm -hmm. we've, we've sort of shrunk the issue down to a really irrelevant, the, as I said, mm -hmm. the, the, the home loans are, cannot be a lender of last resort, and right. the Federal Reserve really can't be a lender of last resort because it doesn't have to lend money to a failing member. Right. But now the Federal Reserve has an idea that at least I've, I've been hearing about um, through different industry channels that there may be a proposal in the next few months to require banks to pre-position collateral at the Federal Reserve with with this idea that there's this small runway of when a bank encounters difficulty to when it becomes failing, maybe something like five days. And if there was enough collateral at the Fed during that five days, you could turn the ship around before it sinks. Um, am I am I describing that that idea that people have been kicking around? Right. Yes, absolutely. And um, like all good ideas, they are um, they sound nice in principle. The reality of them becomes what I just said before. The home loans and the Federal Reserve are not open for business after hours. Mm -hmm. So at the, the Fed wire is the only time that the Federal Reserve could actually provide that liquidity funding unless they change the operation, which I haven't heard any serious plans about. Michelle Bowman, in fact, talked about that in some speeches that she made last last month that I quoted in my newsletter. Mm -hmm. um, I I think that there's, you know, it, it sounds nice in principle. Mm 
-hmm. I think the public demands that the Federal Reserve try to do something Mm -hmm. to make to minimize the risks of another incident like a Silicon Valley bank failing. Mm -hmm. Um, But I think it ignores what were some of the key problems at Silicon Valley and Signature Bank that need more thinking. Mm -hmm. Uh, For example, how is it possible that financial institutions that are operating in such an unsafe and unsound manner are allowed to continue operating in an unsafe and unsound manner and should have not been forcibly pushed into fixing the problem beforehand. Mm -hmm. Not that that would have solved the specific runs, but how is it possible that federal agencies don't actually cooperate amongst each other? I'll give you a perfect example of this. I think that uh, the average person who reads the Wall Street Journal could not tell you what the difference was between the federal home loan banks and the federal deposit insurance corporation. Wouldn't Mm -hmm. know what the difference really was. Mm -hmm. I think that that is lost in Washington and among people in the agencies that I've talked to. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not cool that at the end of the day, we say to the public, oh, look, the federal home loan banks never lost a dime because of their preferred interest in collateral. Mm -hmm. But similarly, it's not cool to say, oh, yeah, well, you know, if Silicon Valley goes down, um, maybe the FDIC will come in. Maybe they don't. They only cover up to Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. $250,000. We want to allow too big to fail to not be too big to fail, but still maintain Mm -hmm. too big to fail theoretically. Mm -hmm. And I think that that kind of conflict is what becomes such a source of confusion for the public, becomes such a flashpoint politically in this country in terms of how we manage financial institutions. Now, I've been doing some research just to throw this in. And as you were Mm -hmm. asking me this question, I thought it's worth thinking about. So, you know, if you're going to talk about a five or 10 day window during which a crisis could form Mm -hmm. and you could have some way to manage it. I've been doing some research on Jerry Corrigan. When I worked at the Federal Reserve Bank, he was the president of the Fed. So I had some interactions with him in a a staffer sort of way, but I've been reading through some of his papers. And one of the things that struck me was his comment about financial crises and how central banks need to deal with them. And he said that the central, the main thing, the main operation, main operating goal of a central banker in the middle of a financial crisis is to buy time. Mm-hmm. So if having collateral at the discount window in a classic run that was, say, happening with Washington Mutual or IndyMac during the financial crisis, if that was available and made it slightly easier to get liquidity, Maybe that buy some time, maybe that's a good idea. We could, however, talk about the consequences of extending that requirement well below the largest institutions to smaller, say, 10 to a $50 billion institutions, Mm -hmm. or or potentially examiners give guidance that all banks should have something like this. Mm -hmm. One thing I could tell you is that um, banks are saying, well, I'm concerned about uh, the cannibalization of my collateral with the home loan banks, and I won't be able to really pledge it there because I'm going to have to have it pledged at the Federal Reserve. Mm-hmm. Um, I could also tell you that the federal home loan banks are not exactly making it easy on their members to have collateral at the home loan banks that they then want to re-pledge over to the Federal Reserve. Mm-hmm. Um, it speaks to, again, dysfunctionality, mm-hmm. uh, lack of coordination, lack of communication, despite all the statements that they're going to do. Um, but and, and it also seems like when you talk about the security interest, because I think that's something people mm-hmm. often underappreciate, that the federal home loan banks, like you said, they are they are member owned cooperatives, but they there is a recognition, at least in in the FDIA, that their security interests, like all security interests, come before the unsecured creditors. Mm-hmm. And and so people often talk about it as a super priority lien or something, but it's really just they have a very good first 
security interest. And so they don't want someone like the Fed getting ahead of them in the discount when with the with the interest at the discount window. They don't want someone like the FDIC as subrogee of deposits getting ahead of them. Um, right. And and for te- for politicians, that's fine because they're they're a private organization. So this idea that they have a windfall security interest or a total security interest that 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 doesn't get as much headline as if we talk about how the FDIC is funded. Right. Well, I remember the FDIC is a receiver in bankruptcy of a bank. Right. So uh, you know that receivers have a right to deny uh, even preferred claims. Mm-hmm. It would be one day very interesting if the FDIC really wanted to press its claim mm-hmm. that it could reject the federal home loan bank to get paid. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we haven't had that. Nobody no. really wants to press the nuclear button. I think we just yeah. want to threaten it. <laughs> yes. But when you talk about that stacking of of interests in the runway, I kind of also think about there can be the opposite problem that we saw with the recent failure of of Republic First Bank in mm-hmm. Pennsylvania, that there you had a fairly small institution, six billion in assets, four billion in deposits, half of which were uninsured. And at least from what I could see, that bank was in trouble for a while, that it mm-hmm. was late having its financial statements for 2022 because of material weaknesses. It had ongoing lawsuits among its directors. Um, it, it just seemed to have a lot of, at least from what I could see as an uninvolved external person, mm-hmm. a lot of problems. And I've been reading that over the last couple of years of its its life, it became steadily more reliant on the discount window, the bank term funding program, and advances from the federal home loan bank system for its funding such that when it failed, there were several hundred million outstanding to those um, to, to those creditors. Plus, there was another two billion or so in collateralized deposits, so secured interests of municipalities. And that's kind of why the FDIC took such a huge expected loss on it. So in that case, we waited hoping things would turn around and and they didn't. And now the FDIC has this big loss. Well, I think people were playing for time to see if the bank could get acquired. The deal fell through. That's kind of what really triggered the final failure. Mm-hmm. Um, the fact that the institution got into the position that it did, in, even though asset quality has been generally strong, even though the economy is not in a deep recession, um, tells you something about the quality of this institution. Um, and again, it raises the question, how come examiners are not addressing these institutions sooner? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I don't, I think, you know, you mentioned the home loan banks having advances to Republic First. I, I think that um, it gets back to the point I'm making that I don't know if the home loan banks want the role of being able to determine the members that can't pay. They they are trying. They they have to address what the FHFA has said. You cannot be a lender of last resort. You cannot look to the collateral as the primary means of payment. You have to see if the ability to pay. You have to test that. But um, I think that there's a lot of concern on their part, mm-hmm. legitimately so that by denying an advance, they could actually precipitate exactly what, you know, they could be the cause of a bank mm-hmm. failure. So I, uh, I think that I think that there's going to be changes. I think they're going to be slow. And I think that, um, you know, at, at this point, it's about how the, how I, I don't mean to be overly cynical, but I think this is much more about playing to the public and saying we're doing something. Mm-hmm. than necessarily for sure finally solving that finally knocking the nail not locking down the last plank and right. being able to sure make sure that we don't have more bank failures right and the federal home loan banks also have something of an information asymmetry that like you said would make it not only undesirable but hard for them to assess asset quality that they're not examiners they're not involved in monetary policy 
they're they're not under that that um, the, the kind of the dome of the federal government. Uh, and so when when you see but, things but like, they do have Matthew, they, they do have a regulatory apparatus. It's called mm-hmm. the Federal Reserve, the state banking uh, yep. commission uh, departments, the mm-hmm. OCC, the FDIC, uh, mm-hmm. a whole bunch of other regulators who who are supposed to be coordinating and communicating with the federal home loan banks. Mm-hmm. Perfect example of this. Let's take the FHFA rule mm-hmm. that no FHLB can lend to a bank. With a zero, with a negative tangible common equity ratio, mm-hmm. and that that's in the rules. Twelve sixty six, I think, is the section of the FHFA Act. So, um, okay. Now, what when the Federal Reserve changed the regulatory capital rules in nineteen ninety four, mm-hmm. and went to risk based capital requirements, and also made a change to say that banks blow, you know, banks should not include AOCI, mark to market in the bond portfolio, in their capital calculation, and then refine that to just under $250 billion in 2008. Yep. This rule was never updated or changed by the FHFA. Mm-hmm. The FHFA continued to maintain a gap-based tangible common equity ratio. Now, you might say, well, and given what just happened, Good thing that they didn't, but that's not the point. The point is that when the FHLBs said, wait a minute, why do we have this capital requirement for banks for who we lend to, but the banks themselves report without the the AOCI, why can't all this be coordinated? Nothing happened Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for 20 years. Right. So, so I have to sit there and think, you know, it, there's a lot of posturing around coordination, but nothing ever gets done in Washington. Everybody has their own way of their own franchise, their own agency, mm-hmm. and they're going to manage it their way with their rules. And right. I'm astounded. This is why you have the kind of problems that you do have, or at least one of the reasons why I think. On that topic of lack of coordination, I think that you also have some views on the recent merger proposals that there was the earlier one out of the OCC, the the more mm-hmm. recent one out of the FDIC. I think we've kind of heard silence or or less than silence from the Fed on on they're not going to do one. Um, and and despite the fact that the OCC principal is on the FDIC board, their proposals are different. What what what's your view on on these um, incongruous proposals? Again, it's it's it fits the same narrative which I've been trying to push, which is that there is lack of coordination among the agencies, mm-hmm. and um, there's more posturing in front of Capitol Hill than there really is attempt to fix that lack of coordination. And uh, when the FH when the FDIC and the and the Federal Reserve reports on the failures of First Republic Signature and Silicon Valley came out last year. They all pointed towards uh, the requirement that the home loans and the federal and the regulators need to be talking more. Mm-hmm. The communication needs to be improved. Um, and certainly, there is more communication, but whether any information is passing through is is still open to question. I, I just I keep pounding on that. I, I think yeah. this is a good example of that. Like why, mm-hmm. if you have an umbrella organization like the FFIC, why, if everybody's supposed to be on the same page, why would you then release different kind of merger proposals, which, by the way, only leave the constituents more confused, undermine the ability to have the mergers? And we were just talking about Republic first. Perhaps some of the problems around that merger, I'm not that familiar with the circumstance of it, but uh, why it got called off, but perhaps some of the problems had to be regulatory problems. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be that way. We should have a streamlined system. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, just by the same token, it's very hard to get chartered for a new bank in this country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, same problems. Yes. Yeah. No, I, I deal with it all the time in, in my practice of mm-hmm. trying to pick which state you're going to get seek a charter from. And then even if you pick a, a state that is open to it, well, which Federal Reserve District will you be in? 
And um, what's your likelihood going before the FDIC board based on its current or expected composition? Um, and, and all of these are investments that are substantial. Well, I think I think it's important to emphasize it's not a problem that we have different agencies. I mean, you know, yeah. institutionally, the Federal Reserve and the other regulators have always viewed the dual banking system where you have different regulators and you have competition mm -hmm. as a good thing, not a bad thing. That it would not hold, it would you you could you run the risk if there was one regulator of stifling innovation. Mm -hmm. Because the regulator was against this when this, some other state regulator might be for it or other regulators. So, you know, there's something to be said for that. All I'm saying is that, OK, that's true, but you need to coordinate. Mm -hmm. I, don't put me into a position where I'm doing X to satisfy this regulator, but running afoul as a result of you. Right. Right. That's the problem. That's mm -hmm. what needs to be fixed. Yes, it is frustrating that these these banks that want to get chartered and they sit down with a state who says, oh, we'll give you a charter for for if you do X, Y and Z. And then down the road, they they discover, well, well, the FDIC has a negative view of that state and the FDIC is never going to give you deposit insurance if you're from that state. Well, that's also leadership in Washington. We mm -hmm. need to have elected officials in the Senate and the House mm -hmm. who want to lead on these kinds of things and coordinate and pull the different agencies together mm -hmm. and craft legislation around that. But, you know, there is no such cooperation, There's no cooperation on a lot of topics, but but certainly banking is the, the only issues around banking or preventing the next financial crisis, that, not making a stronger banking system. And right now, by the way, the banking system only accounts for 20 percent of all credit in the U.S. anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a shrinking component of the overall capital markets. If we want to continue to make banks irrelevant and become non-bank like Apollo and other private credit providers continue to uh, get in on the act that what banks have traditionally done, we're working in that direction. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me a little bit more about while well, we have a couple minutes left about the bank treasury newsletter that it is for banks? And can you tell us a little bit about where it came from, what kinds of topics it covers, stuff well, like that. Well, I, I was an II rank bank analyst at uh, at Solomon Brothers when I, I I came from the I worked at the Fed, and then when I went to the after I left the Fed in '94, I went to Solomon Brothers as a corporate bond bank analyst, and I was publishing, and I had a great time. And when I left that in '03 to go to the market side, it, it's then Citigroup. I wanted to have something that I could contribute, but I was in sales, and sales from a compliance standpoint can't produce research. So I came up with this great idea to call my publication a bank treasury newsletter. And actually, you know, our economist, uh, Bob DiClemente, had this piece called Comments on Credit. So I wanted to call, call it Comments on Banks. But then I thought to myself, nah, don't do that. It's too, you have to come up with something else. And um, so that's how I, I developed it. And and really, it was what did Ethan learn from talking to bank treasurers and CFOs and some of the CEOs that I met and board people in my travels every month? And I've mm -hmm. been doing this now for over for 20 years. Wow. And, um, you know, it's interesting writing something every month. You'd think you'd run out of topics to be tr truthful. I, I've never gone through any month in, in 20 years where there hasn't been something really interesting to talk about that I wasn't talking about really about the month before. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's pretty exciting. That's great. Well, Ethan, I want to thank you for coming on Credibly Challenged. We really appreciate your time and thoughts. Um, and also I want to thank the listeners. Without you, we wouldn't have a reason to do these programs. As always, stay tuned for the next episode. Thanks. Thanks.